In the last video, I introduced linear codes, which take binary messages from the message space and use a special matrix called a generator matrix to lift them up into higher dimensional space, which is the code word space. The output of the messages in the higher dimensional space are called the valid code words. And because the valid code words end up being spread apart, we are able to correct errors by moving invalid code words to the nearest code word. We also learned that because the generator matrix is a linear map, it turns out that with linear codes, the sum of any two valid code words is another valid code word. When there is a minimum distance d between any pair of valid code words, we are guaranteed to be able to fix d minus 1 over 2 bit errors in a code word, rounded down to the nearest integer. In this video, I'm going to introduce cyclic polynomial codes. With polynomial codes, instead of thinking of messages and code words as vectors, we instead think of them as polynomials. The Reed Solomon codes used by the Voyager probes to send images of the solar system back to Earth are a special case of cyclic polynomial codes. First, I'll define a cyclic code. A cyclic code is a collection of valid code words where any circular shift of the bits in a valid code word results in another valid code word. So if we wanted to do a cyclic shift of this code word to the right, we'd move these four bits over to the right, and then move this last bit over to the beginning. And to do a circular shift of this code word, we do the same thing, shift these four bits to the right, and move the last one over to the beginning. And doing circular shifts repeatedly, we get this and this, and a circular shift of this code word brings us back to where we started with the original code word that we have. So with these five valid code words, since every circular shift of a valid code word gives us another valid code word, this set of valid code words satisfies the definition of a cyclic code. Notice, however, that the sum of these two valid code words gives us an invalid code word that isn't part of the code. So cyclic codes are not necessarily linear. That said, for all practical purposes, in real life, we're mostly interested in cyclic codes that are also linear codes. So here's an example of a collection of valid code words where all cyclic shifts result in other valid code words. Also, adding any two valid code words results in another valid code word. So this is a code which is both linear and cyclic. Now, with cyclic codes, we often represent the code words as polynomials. So with this code word where the bits are b0, b1, b2, all the way to bn, we can represent this as a polynomial by multiplying each bit by a power of x and adding all the terms together. So the b0 bit gets the 0th power of x, which is just the number 1. b1 gets the first power of x, which is just x b2 gets x squared, and bn gets x to the power n. And this is the resulting polynomial for this code word. For a more specific example, with the binary message 1011, this gets an x to the 0, this gets an x to the 1, this gets an x to the 2, and this gets an x to the 3. So the polynomial for this message is 1 plus x squared plus x cubed. Now, previously, we used a generator matrix to transform messages into the valid code words. For polynomial codes, instead, we multiply a message polynomial by a special generator polynomial to get the valid code word polynomials. Even though the generator matrix and generator polynomial are different approaches to generating valid code words, the main idea behind them is the same. This very simple generator matrix transforms the 1-bit messages 0 and 1 into the valid code words 0, 0, and 1, 1. Visually, the 2D code space would look like this, where the valid code words are colored in blue. This is very similar to using the generator polynomial 1 plus x to turn the 1-bit messages 0 and 1 into the valid code words 0 and 1 plus x. The 2D code word space looks very similar, except we think of this direction as being associated with x to the power 0, or the number 1, 
and this direction is associated with x to the power 1, or just x. Similarly, the best 2 out of 3 repetition code has this generator matrix, and the code word space looks like this. This is similar to using a generator polynomial 1 plus x plus x squared and getting a code word space with the directions 1, x, and x squared. Now, these cases of generator polynomials I've shown you are extremely simple. In order to understand the more complicated cases, I'm going to need to discuss a few properties about polynomials. Specifically, I'm going to talk about how polynomials are very similar to the integers. Just as when sometimes we divide integers and get a remainder, we can also divide two polynomials and get a polynomial remainder. And just as we can do modular arithmetic with integers, we can also do modular arithmetic with polynomials. And just as there are special integers with no factors called prime numbers, there are special polynomials with no factors called irreducibles. Before I go into detail about polynomials, I'm going to introduce some notation for polynomial sets. When we see notation like this, we're talking about the set of all polynomials in the x variable with numbers from this set as the coefficients. So this denotes the set of all polynomials in the x variable with real number coefficients. So this would be an example of a polynomial in this set. We call this polynomial set r adjoin x. This denotes the set of all polynomials in the y variable with integers as coefficients. And here's an example of a polynomial in this set. This denotes the set of all polynomials in x with the integers mod 2 as coefficients. So with the integers mod 2, the only coefficient numbers are 0 and 1. And here's an example of that. In this video, we're mostly going to be interested in polynomials from this set, because they correspond to binary messages. So let's start with division properties. I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that when we divide two integers, we don't always get a nice round answer. There might be some remainder left over. In the case of 17 divided by 5, the answer is 3 with remainder 2. Because in order to get 17, we can fit in three copies of the number 5, but we're stuck with 2 left over. And in general, Anytime we divide an integer a by another integer b, we'll get another integer q, called the quotient, as the answer. And sometimes we'll get an extra part left over, which is called the remainder r. The remainder r is always going to be less than b. If r was equal to or greater than b, we could always just subtract b from the remainder and add 1 to the quotient instead. Now, this same formula also applies to polynomials. If we divide this polynomial x cubed plus x squared plus 1 by another polynomial, x squared plus 1, we'll get this quotient polynomial plus some extra remainder polynomial. And for polynomials, the remainder can actually be negative, but the remainder polynomial will always have a degree that's less than the divisor which is the blue polynomial here. So here the divisor has degree 2 because of the x squared, and the remainder polynomial has a smaller degree of 1 because of the x to the 1. So with integers, the size of the remainder r will always be less than the divisor b. And with polynomials, the degree of the remainder r will always be less than the divisor polynomial. Now you might be wondering how I got this answer, how I performed the polynomial division. It turns out that doing polynomial division is very similar to doing long division with integers. With integer long division, we ask the question of how many times a divisor, in this case 11, fits into a dividend, in this case 5625. Now this problem is probably too difficult to do in your head, so instead we break it up into smaller problems. We start by asking how many times 11 fits into 56. And the best we can do is get 55, which is 11 times 5. So we write a 5 up here. Now what we actually did here is break up the dividend into 5600 plus 25. And when we did 11 times 5, 
we were actually doing 11 times 500 to get 5,500. So we've successfully fit 500 11s into the dividend, but now we need to take care of the rest, which after subtracting 5,500 is 125. Then we see that 11 fits into 12 one time, and this is really 11 times 10, which is 110. And after subtracting 110, we get the leftover to be 15. 11 fits into this one time, so we take away 11, and we're left with 4, which is the remainder. So when we divide 5,625 by 11, the quotient is 511, and the remainder is 4. Polynomial division follows a very similar process. When we divide the dividend x to the 5 plus x to the 4 plus x squared plus 1 by the divisor x squared plus 1, it's also probably too hard to do in your head. So we break it up into smaller problems. First we ask how we can take the divisor x squared plus 1 and get x to the 5th. And we can do that by multiplying by x cubed. So what this really means is that we fit in x squared plus 1 times x cubed, which is equal to x to the 5 plus x cubed, into this big polynomial. So we need to subtract that and work with whatever is left over. And this ends up being x to the 4 minus x cubed plus x squared plus 1. And if we ask how we can take the divisor x squared plus 1 to get x to the 4, we can do that by multiplying by x squared. And the divisor times x squared is just x to the 4 plus x squared. And when we subtract that off, we get negative x cubed plus 1. To get negative x cubed from the divisor, we multiply by negative x. And the divisor times negative x is negative x cubed minus x. And subtracting that off, we're left with x plus 1. Since the degree of x plus 1 is lower than the divisor of x squared plus 1, we stop here since we can't do a multiplication with the divisor that ends up giving us a lower degree. So dividing these polynomials, we get a quotient of x cubed plus x squared minus x and a remainder of x plus 1. So polynomial division is very similar to integer division. We just break up the polynomial into small parts and keep trying to fit the divisor inside, subtracting the results as we go until we get a remainder whose degree is smaller than the degree of the divisor. Next, I'll show you how we can do modular arithmetic with polynomials. Recall that for integers, doing modular arithmetic is a bit like doing math on a clock where the top hour is 0 instead of 12. When we do addition, if the sum gets large enough, we just wrap around and start counting from 0 again. This would be an example of the integers mod 12, since in this case the number 12 is equivalent to 0. We sometimes write the integers mod 12 like this, where the z indicates the set of integers, and whatever we put behind the slash is equivalent to 0. So here the number 12 is equivalent to 0. We also sometimes write it like this, z subscript 12, for convenience. So if we're dealing with the integers mod 5, since the number 8 is equal to 5 plus 3, recall that whatever is behind the slash is equivalent to 0, so we can set this 5 to 0. This means that 8 is equivalent to 3 in the set of integers mod 5. Similarly, since 17 is equal to 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 2, we can again set all the 5s to 0 and see that 17 is equivalent to 2 when working mod 5. In the set of integers mod 2, because 6 is 2 plus 2 plus 2, again we just look at whatever is behind the slash and set it to 0. So 6 is equivalent to 0 mod 2. And in the case of negative 1, negative 1 is really equal to negative 2 plus 1. So we set this 2 to 0, and we find that negative 1 is equivalent to positive 1 mod 2. Now, let's see an example of modular arithmetic with polynomials. Here we're taking the set of polynomials in x with integer coefficients, and taking it mod the polynomial x cubed minus x. 
So if we have this polynomial x cubed minus x plus 2x squared plus 5, what would this be equivalent to? Recall that whatever is behind the slash is equivalent to 0. So we can set x cubed minus x to 0 and find that this polynomial is equivalent to 2x squared plus 5. And this is when we're working mod x cubed minus x. Here's a slightly more tricky example with the polynomial x to the power 5. Now we are working mod x cubed minus x, but we don't really see any x cubed minus x polynomials in this. So what we can do instead is rewrite x to the power 5 as x cubed times x squared. Now again, recall that whatever is behind this slash is equivalent to 0. So that means that x cubed is equivalent to x. So we can replace this x cubed with x. And multiplying x by x squared gives us another x cubed, which is again equivalent to x. So it turns out that x to the power 5 is in fact equivalent to x when we're working mod x cubed minus x. So modular arithmetic with polynomials is a little more complicated than modular arithmetic with integers. But all you have to remember is that whatever is behind the slash is equivalent to zero. And if you remember that, then reducing polynomials mod some other polynomial shouldn't be that hard. Finally, I'll talk about irreducibles, which are the equivalent of prime numbers for polynomials. With the integers, some integers are called composites, which means that they can be factored. For example, 6 can be broken up into the factors 2 times 3, and 35 can be broken up into the factors 5 times 7. Prime numbers are the integers which can't be factored, and these include 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and so on. Now, of course, any integer can be written as a product of 1 and itself, but we don't really count that as real factoring. A prime number can't be broken up into any multiplication of factors other than the trivial case of one and itself. Now with polynomials, we call polynomials that can be factored reducibles. So working in the set of polynomials in X with real coefficients, you might remember that we can factor the polynomial X squared minus four because it's a difference of squares. And so we can factor this into x plus 2 times x minus 2. We can also factor the polynomial x squared plus 2x plus 1 into x plus 1 times x plus 1. So these polynomials are reducible because we can factor them. A couple examples of irreducible polynomials for polynomials in x with real coefficients are the polynomials x squared plus 1 and x squared plus x plus 1. These are called irreducible polynomials because when working with real coefficients, the only way these can be factored is in the trivial case by taking the polynomial and multiplying it by 1. But since that trivial case doesn't really count, we generally say that these polynomials can't be factored and are therefore irreducible. Now, if you're familiar with the complex numbers, you might argue that x squared plus 1 can be factored into x minus i times x plus i, where i is the square root of negative 1. But recall that I mentioned that the set of polynomials we were dealing with involved real coefficients, so we can't use complex numbers like i. So an interesting fact about polynomials is they can be factored in certain coefficients, but not others x squared plus 1 can't be factored with real coefficients in r adjoin x, but it can be factored with complex coefficients in c adjoin x. If you like my videos, please check the links in the description and consider supporting me.